Greetings to all of you, my dear sisters and brothers and my dear friends. A warm welcome to all of you from your pastor, Yeti. We are in part three of the grace of giving, of the study of the be encouraged by the second letter to the Corinthians, and we are in chapter nine. It seems strange that we Christians need encouragement to give when God has given so much to us. God has enriched the Corinthians in a wonderful way, and yet they were hesitant, uh, hesitant to share what they had with others. They were not accustomed to grace given. So Paul had to explain it to them. Having explained grace giving to them, Paul then tried to motivate them to get involved in the sp uh, special offering. He did this by sharing five encouragements that related to grace given. And I think in this part we're going to go to the second one. And tomorrow start with the third one and fourth and fifth one. So the first one is your giving will provokes others chapter 9 the verses 1 to 5 in the second Corinthians while Christians must not compete with other with each other in their service for Christ they ought to consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works when we see what God is doing in and through the lives of others we ought to strive to serve him better ourselves. There is a fine line between fleshly imitation and spiritual emulation, and we must be careful in this regard. But a zealous Christian can be the means of steering up a church and motivating people to pray, work, witness, and give. The interesting thing is this. Paul had used the zeal of Christians to challenge the Macedonians, but now he was using the Macedonians to challenge the Corinthians. A year before, the Christians had enthusiastically boasted that they would share in the offering. But then they had done nothing. The Macedonians had followed through and their, on their promise, and Paul was afraid that his boasting would be in vain. Paul sent Titus and the other brothers to Corinth to steer them up to share in the offering. Far more important than the money itself was the spiritual benefit that would come to the church as they shared in the response to God's grace in their lives. Paul had written to the church before to tell them how to take up the contributions. So there was no excuse for their delay. Paul wanted the entire contribution to be ready when he and his um, finances committee arrived, so there might not be any last-minute collections that might appear to be forced on the church. What did Paul want to avoid? Embarrassment to himself and to the church if the offerings was not ready. For after all, there were several representatives from the Macedonian churches on the special committee. Paul had boasted to the Macedonians about Corinth, and now he feared that his boasting might be in vain. Apparently, Paul did not see anything wrong or unspiritual about asking people to promise to give. He did not tell him how much they had to promise, but he did expect them to keep their promise. When a person signs up for a telephone, he promises to pay a certain amount each month. If it is acceptable to make financial commitments for things like telephones, cars, and credit cards, 
certainly it had to be acceptable to make commitments for the work of the Lord. Notice the words that Paul used as he wrote about the collection. It was ministering to the saints, a service to fellow believers. It was also a bounty, which means a generous gift. Was Paul perhaps hinting that the Corinthians gave more than they had planned? However, Paul was carefully not to put on any pressure. He wanted their gifts to be a matter of bounty, generosity, and not as of kofthosness, something squeezed out of them. High pressure offering appeals do not belong to grace giving. Our greatest encouragement for giving is that it pleases the Lord. But there is nothing wrong with practicing the kind of giving that provokes others to give. This does not mean that we should advertise what we do as individuals, because that kind of practice would violate one of the basic principles of giving. Give secretly to the Lord. However, Paul was writing to churches, and it is not wrong for congregations to announce what they have given collectively. If our motive is to boast, then we are not practicing grace giving. But if our desire is to provoke others to share, then God's grace can work through us to help others. The second thing, your giving will bless you. Chapter 9, verses 6 to 11. Give, and it shall be given unto you, was our Lord's promise, and it is still holds true. The good measure he gives back to us is not always money or material goods, but is always worth far more than we gave. Giving is not something we do, but something we are. Giving is a way of life for the Christian who understands the grace of God. The world simply does not understand a statement like Proverbs. One man gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. In grace giving, our motive is not to get something, but receiving God's blessing is one of the friend's benefits. If our giving is to bless us and build us up, we must be careful to follow the principle that Paul explained in this section. Here is one, the principle of increase we reap in measure as we sow. This principle needs little explanation because we see it operating in everyday life. The farmer who sows much seed will have a better chance for a bigger harvest. The investor who puts a large sum of money in the bank will certainly collect more dividends. The more we invest in the work of the Lord, the more fruit will abound to our account. Whenever we are tempted to forget this principle, we need to remind ourselves that God was unsparing in his giving. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? In both nature and grace, God is a generous giver, and he who would be godly must follow the divine example. Another one, the principle of intent. We reap as we saw with the right motives. Motive make absolutely no difference to the farmer. If he sows good seed and has good weather, he will reap a harvest whether he is working for profit, pleasure, or pride. It makes no difference how he plans to use the money that he earns. The harvest will probably come just the same. But not so with the Christian. Motive in giving 
or in any other activity is vitally important. Our giving must come from the heart, and the motive in the heart must please God. We must not be sad givers who gives grudgingly, or mad givers who give because we have of the necessity, but we should be glad givers who cheerfully share what we have because we have experienced the grace of God. He that had a bountiful eye shall be blessed. If we cannot give joyfully, the Greek word gives us our English word hilarious, then we must open our hearts to the Lord and ask Him to grant us His grace. And certainly God can bless a gift that is given out of a sense of duty. God, on, God cannot bless the giver unless his heart is right. Grace giving means that God blesses the giver as well as the gift, and that the giver is a blessing to others. Here's another one. The principle of immediacy. We reap even while we are sowing. The farmer has to wait for his harvest. But the believer who practices grace giving begins to reap the harvest immediately. To be sure, there are long range benefits for our giving, but there are also immediate blessings to begin with. We start to share God's abundance grace. The universals in this verse are staggerings, all grace, always, all sufferings, every good work. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. This does not mean that God makes every Christian wealthy in material things, but it does mean that the Christian who practices grace giving will always have what he needs when he needs it. Furthermore, the grace of God enriches him morally and spiritually so that he grows in Christian character. In his walk and his work, he depends wholly on the sufficiency of God. It is disturbing to see how many Christians today are totally dependent on others for their spiritual resources. Preachers cannot get sermons unless they borrow them from books or another resource. Church offers are bewildered about what to do with a problem unless they phone two or three well-known preachers for advice. Far too many churches, church members have to consult with the pastor once a week or they fall apart spiritually. The word suffering uh, sufficiency means adequate resources within. And through Jesus Christ, we can have the adequacy to meet the demands of life. As Christians, we do need to help and encourage one another. But we must not depend on one another. Our dependence must be on the Lord. And he alone can give us that well of water in the heart that makes us sufficient for him. We not only share God's grace, but we also share his righteousness. Paul quoted Psalm 112, verse 9, to prove his point. That psalm describes the righteous man who has no fears because his heart is sincere and obedient to the Lord. Paul did not suggest that we earn righteousness by our giving, because the Lord's way, only the way to get righteousness is by faith in Jesus Christ. However, if our hearts are right, our giving will be used by God to make our character righteous. Grace giving builds Christian character. We reap as we sow, and we share God's miracle, multiplication of what we give and do. The farmer has to decide how much seed he will keep for food and how much he will plant. If the harvest has been loan, there is less seed available, but for eating and planting. But the Christian who believes in grace giving never has to worry about this decision. God supplies all that he needs. There's always spiritual and material bread for the eating and spiritual and material seed for the sowing. 
Paul referred here to Isaiah 55 verses 10 and 11, a passage that uses seed and bread to refer to both the Word of God and to the liberal harvest in the field. There is no such thing as secular and sacred or sacred in the Christian life. The giving of money is just as spiritual an act as the singing of a hymn or the handing out of the gospel tract. Money is seed. If we give it according to the principle of grace, it will multiply to the glory of God and meet many needs. If we use it in ways other than God desires, the harvest will be poor. Finally, as we saw, we are enriched and we are enriched others. The farmer reaps immediate physical benefits as he works in his field, but he has to wait for the harvest. The Christian who is motivated by grace reaps the blessings of personal enrichment in his or her own life and character, and this enrichment benefits others. The final result is glory to God as others give thanks to Him. Paul was careful to point out that grace giving does not bring credit to us, it brings thanksgiving to God. We are but channels through whom God works to meet the needs of the others. But 2 Corinthians 9 verse 11 teaches another truth. God enriches us so that we may give even more bountifully. One of the joys of grace giving is the joy of giving more and more. Everything we have, not just our income, belongs to God, is given to God, and is used by God to accomplish His work. We are enriched in everything because we share everything with Him and with others. Grace giving means that we really believe that God is the great giver and we use our material and spiritual resources accordingly. You simply cannot outgive God. So for tomorrow we can start the third point that Paul gives us here. Tomorrow it's going to be your giving will meet needs. So my dear ones, again, there is so much in this um, part. Take your time. Let it come to you. Listen to it maybe a couple of times and pray over it. Take it with you and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you, as I'm now talking to myself too, that the Holy Spirit reveals the way we are givers in the grace of the giving. Blessings to all of you, my dear ones. This is your Pastor Yeti. I love you guys. Bye.